Barker Speaks, the CCRU interview with Professor D.C. Barker from the CCRU writings. Daniel Charles Barker has been professor of anorganic semiotics at Kingsport College, MVU, Massachusetts, since 1992. His extraordinary intellectual achievements resist easy summarization, involving profound and polymathic engagement across the entire range of life and earth sciences. In addition to archaeocultural research, mathematical semiotics, anatomical linguistics, and informatic engineering. Trained as a cryptographer in the early 1970s, he has spent his life decoding ancient scripts, quasi-biotic residues, and anomalous mineral patterns, amongst other things. In late autumn 1998, CCRU met with Professor Barker in his office at MVU. The following is an edited transcript of that meeting. Tick Systems Cryptography has been my guiding thread right through. What is geotraumatics about, even now? A rigorous practice of decoding. So I haven't really shifted at all in this respect. There's a voyage, but a strangely immobile one. I started out at MIT working in the information sciences. My thesis proposal was quite conservative, involving mostly technical issues to do with noise reduction and signal modulation. But MVU was just getting started, and my research was transferred across to them that led to various contacts, and from there to employment with a NASA-related organization that has particular interests connected to SETI activity. My task was to help toughen up the theoretical basis of their signals analysis. They wanted to know how to discriminate, in principle, between intelligent communication and complex pattern derived from non-intelligent sources. To cut a long story short, it became increasingly obvious to me that although they said they were hunting for intelligence, what they were really seeking was organization. The whole program was fundamentally misguided. Various people had big problems with the direction of my research, which had basically veered off the organizational model. The social friction became intolerable, and I had to leave which was messy because of my high level security clearance. Suborganizational pattern is where things really happen. When you strip out all the sedimented redundancy from the side of the investigation itself, the assumption of intentionality, subjectivity, interpretability, structure, etc., what remains are assemblies of functionally interconnected microstimuli or tick systems, coincidental information deposits, seismocryptons, suborganic quasi-replicators, bacterial circuitries, polypoid diagonalizations, interphase R virus, echo DNA, ionizing nanopopulations, plus the macro machineries of their suppression or depotentiation. Prevailing signalectics and information science are both insufficiently abstract and over-theoretical in this regard. They cannot see the machine for the apparatus or the singularity for the model. So tick systems require an approach that is cosmic abstract hypermaterialist, and also participative. Methods do not interpret assemblies as a concretization of prior theories and imminent models that transmute themselves at the level of the signals they process. Tick systems are entirely intractable to subject-object segregation or to rigid disciplinary typologies. There is no order of nature, no epistemology or scientific metaposition, and no unique level of intelligence. To advance in this area, which is the cosmos, requires new cultures, or what amounts to the same, new machines. The problem was how to quantify disorganized multiplicities. Diagonal, irregular, molecular, and non-metric quantities require a scale that is itself non-metric, that escapes over coding. Standard procedures of measurement and classification prove entirely inadequate since they presuppose rigid conceptual segmentation by quantity and quality. Deleuze, Guattari's twin pincers of molarity, type, and degree. Once things are being worked out at the level of tick assemblies or flat ticking arrays, there are only intensive populations, and measurement has to give way to engineering fusional multiplicities. Systems that count themselves only the way they propagate, imminently numbering multitudes, like nanoplastic quantum swirls. Eventually, a machinic solution was provided by the tick distributor, but that came later. At first, there was just the equation, precipitated in what I still thought to be my own body. Virtual tick density equals geotraumatic tension. Geotraumatics. I came to Freud relatively late, 
associating it with edible reductionism, and more generally, with a psychologistic stance that was simply irrelevant to cryptographic work. It's important to remark here, no doubt we'll get back to this, that everything productive in Signal's analysis stems from stripping out superfluous prejudices about the source and meaning of complex functional patterns. I took, and still take, the vigorous repudiation of hermeneutics to be the key to theoretical advance in processing science systems. It was Echidna Stowell who helped me to see Freud from the other side. It was a difficult period for me. There had been a lot of painful fallout from the NASA work. Psychotherapists were involved, in part attempting to pathologize and discredit my research, and in part responding to real stress-related symptoms. Between the two was a gray zone of traumatic dysfunction and paranoia involving difficult feedback effects. Stillwell persuaded me that the only way to get through this was to try and make sense of it, and that this is not the same as submitting to the interpretive mode. On the contrary, and beyond the pleasure principle, Freud takes a number of crucial initial steps toward mapping the geocosmic unconscious as a traumatic megasystem, with life and thought dynamically quantized in terms of anorganic tension, elasticity, or machinic plexion. This requires the anorganizational materialist returning of an entire vocabulary, trauma, unconscious, drive, association, screen, memory, condescension, regression, displacement, complex, repression, disavow, e.g. the unprefix, identity, and person. Deleuze and Guattari ask, who does the earth think it is? It's a matter of consistency. Start with a scientific story, which goes like this. Between 4.5 and 4 billion years ago, during the Hadean epoch, the earth was kept in a state of superheated molten slag through the conversion of planetesimal and meteoric impacts into temperature increase, kinetic to thermic energy. As the solar system condensed, the rate and magnitude of collision steadily declined, and the terrestrial surface cooled due to the radiation of heat into space, reinforced by the beginnings of the hydrocycle. During the ensuing Archaeon epoch, the molten core was buried within a crustal shell, producing an insulated reservoir of primal exogenous trauma, the geocosmic motor of terrestrial transmutation. And that's it. That's Plutonics, or Neoplutonism. It's all there, an organic memory, Plutonic looping of external collisions into interior content, impersonal trauma as drive mechanism, the descent into the body of the Earth corresponds to a regression through cosmic time. Trauma is a body. Ultimately, at its pole of maximum disequilibrium, it's an iron thing. At MVU, they call it Cathel, the interior third of terrestrial mass, semi-fluid metallic ocean, mega molecule, and pressure cooker beyond imagination. It's hotter than the surface of the sun down there, 3,000 clicks below the crust. And all that thermic energy is sheer and personal, non-subjective memory of the outside running the plate tectonic machinery of the planet via the conductive and convective dynamic of silicate magma flux, bathing the whole system in electromagnetic fields as it tidally pulses to the orbit of the moon. Cathel is a terrestrial inner nightmare, nocturnal ocean, Xanadu, the anorganic metal body trauma howl of the Earth, cross-hatched by intensities, traversed by thermic waves and currents, deranged particles, ionic strippings and gluttonings, gravitational deep sensitivities transduced into non-local electromesh and feeding volcanism. That's why plutonic science slides continuously into schizophrenic delirium. Fast forward seismology and you hear the earth scream. Geotrauma is an ongoing process whose tension is continually expressed, partially frozen, in biological organization. For instance, the peculiarly locked up life forms we tend to see as typical those more or less obedient to Darwinian selection mechanics are less than 600 million years old. They begin with a planetary oxygenization crisis, triggered by the saturation of crustal iron, followed by mass oxygen poisoning of the prokaryotic biosystem and the emergence of a eukaryotic regime. Eukaryotic cells are highly suppressive. They implement a nuclear command control model based on genomic ROM, a fin to meiosis mitosis Diplo capture, hierarchical organization, and multicellular specialization. Even the distinction between autogeny and phylogeny, distinct time orders of the individual and the species, makes little sense without eukaryotic nuclear read only programming and immunological identity. 
evolutionism presupposes specific geotraumatic outcomes. To take a more recent example, the efflorescence of mammalian life occurs in the wake of the KT missile, which combined with massive magma plume activity in the Indian Ocean to shut down the Mesozoic era 65 million years ago. Eruptive volcanism plus extraterrestrial impact linked by coincidence or plutonic looping. So there's a catastrophic transition to a post-Saurian megafauna regime, part of a much larger overall reorganization of terrestrial symptomaticity, providing an index of Neo-Hadian resurgence. And what is mammalian life relative to the great Saurians? Above all, an innovation in mothering, suckling as biosurvivalism. Tell me about your mother and your traveling back to KT, not into the personal unconscious. Spinal catastrophism. For humans, there's a particular crisis of bipedal erect posture to be processed. I was increasingly aware that all my real problems were modalities of back pain or phylogenetic spinal injury, which took me back to the calamitous consequences of the Precambrian explosion roughly 500 million years ago. The ensuing period is incrementally body mapped by metazoan organization. Obviously, there are discrete quasi-coherent neuromotor tick flux patterns whose incrementally bridgified stages are swimming, crawling, and bipedal walking. Alay Morgan persuasively traces the origin of proto-human bipedalism to certain deleterious plate tectonic shifts. The motto is bioseismic. Crustal convulsions in animal body plan are rigorously interconnected, and the entire aquatic ape theory constitutes an exemplary geotraumatic analysis. Erect posture and perpendicularization of the skull is a frozen calamity associated with a long list of pathological consequences, amongst which should be included most of the human psychoneurosis. Numerous trends in contemporary culture attest to the attempted recovery of the ichthyophidian or fleximatile spine, horizontal and impulsive rather than vertical and stress-bearing. The issue here, as always, is real and effective regression. It is not a matter of representational psychology. Consider Haeckel's widely discredited recapitulation thesis, the claim that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. It is a theory compromised by its organicism, but its wholesale rejection was an overreaction. But large response is more productive and balanced, treating DNA as a transorganic memory bank and the spine as a fossil record without rigid ontophylogenic correspondence. The mapping of spinal levels onto neurotic time is supple, episodic, and diagonalizing. It concerns plexion between blocks of machinic transition, not strict isomorphic or stratic redundancy between scales of chronological order. Mammal DNA contains latent fish code, amongst many other things. Palate tectonics. Due to erect posture, the head has been twisted around, shattering vertebral perceptual linearity and setting up the phylogenetic preconditions for the face. This right-angled pneumatic oral arrangement produces the vocal apparatus as a crash site in which thoracic impulses collide with the roof of the mouth. The bipedal head becomes a virtual speech impediment, a subcranial pneumatic pileup, discharges lingual-gestural development, and cephalization takeoff. Burroughs suggests that the proto-human ape was dragged through its body to expire upon its tongue. It's a twin axial system, housing clicks, reciprocally articulated as a vowel consonant phonetic palate, rigidly intersegmented to repress staccato hiss continuous variation and its attendant becomings animal. That's why stammerings, stutterings, vocal tics, extralingual phonetics, and electrodigital voice synthesis are so laden with biopolitical intensity. They threaten to bypass the anthropostructural head smash that establishes our identity with logos, escaping the direction of numbers. Barker numbering. Once numbers are no longer overcoded and thus released from their metric function, they are freed for other things and tend to become diagrammatic. From the beginning of my tick systems work, the most consistent problems have concerned intensive sequences. Sequence is not order. Order already supposes a doubling, a level of redundancy, the sequence sequence. A decoded sequence is something else a sheer numeracy prior to any insertion into chronological structure. That's why decoding number implies an escape from assumptions of progressive time. Tick multitudes arrive in convergent waves, 
without subordination to chronology, history, or linear causation. They proceed by enfolding, involution, or implex. It's a matter of convergence. The numbers do that once they're free to. So the first stage required plexive introgression of the tick density scale, which was numerically rigorized as digital twinning. Tweak the decimal numerals as a set of nine sum twins, zygonivize, and they map an abstract intensive wave, indifferent to magnitude. Everything efficient about digital reduction is concerned with this, since it discovers a key to decimal syzygetic complementarity, nine equals zero, a flattening down to disordered sequentiality, or abstract numerical implex. Nine is the ultimate decimal numeral, operating as positive or full body zero. It is the abstract numeric product of the decimal magnitude minus one, infinitesimalized as one equals 0 0.999 reiterating, which relates to a particular mode of proliferation within capitalist semiotics of the type $99.99. Barker spiral. The pattern really came together with a diplozygetic spiral, which arrived suddenly by chance. I was playing a game of decadence, which I had first encountered many years before. This game already interested me because of its numerical elegance, its complex associations, and its dependence upon a principle of decimal twinning. It had always seemed to hint at a lost syzygetic arithmetism related to the bilateral symmetry of the human body. Digits are fingers, and they come in decimal packages of 2 times 5. In decadence, 5 makes 10 by doubling, or pairing with itself, scoring 0. This tantalized me, but I couldn't fit it together theoretically. The quandary was unlocked on this occasion, when one of the participants casually mentioned the existence of an occulted variation of the game, called sub-decadence, based on a system of 9-sum twinning. Sub-decadence introduces zeros and nine-zero twins. It works by Zygonovic numerism. That was stunning enough in itself, but seeing the two together, or seeing between them, was an incredible moment of diagrammatic assemblage. It all spontaneously condensed, and the spiral clicked into coherence, like a secret door into the long hidden crypt of the decimal system.